Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Vicki Wynn. Savannah is off this morning. Right now on Morning News Now, deadly school shooting. Yet another one. 19 young children and two adults killed when a gunman opened fire inside the Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas. That's just west of San Antonio. Overnight, families waited at this reunification center for news. This morning, the small community now trying to figure out why this happened. My heart was broken today. We're a small community, and we will need your prayers to get us through this. Well, on top of those prayers, President Biden and some lawmakers are calling for action, especially with this tragedy happening just 10 days after the mass shooting in Buffalo, New York. I had hoped when I became president, I would not have to do this again. This only happens in this country and nowhere else. Nowhere else do little kids go to school thinking that they might be shot that day. This morning, flags across the U.S. are at half staff. The investigation already underway into what led to this shooting as the hearts of Uvalde and the nation break over another senseless tragedy. Here's what we know about the shooting. Yesterday morning, police say the 18-year-old gunman shot his grandmother, then drove toward Robb Elementary. After he apparently crashed a pickup truck nearby, investigators say the gunman went to the campus and started shooting inside the school, a school for kids in the second, third, and fourth grades. At least 19 students and two teachers were killed. It's unclear how many others were injured. State officials say the gunman was carrying a rifle and wearing body armor. He was eventually shot and killed by police. Let's bring in NBC News reporter Wendy Woolfolk, who is in Uvalde for us this morning. So, Wendy, what is the latest on the ground there? What are law enforcement officials saying about the attack at this time? Joe, good morning to you. It's been a somber, stormy night here in South Texas. A fourth grade teacher who was shot while protecting her students survived an intense surgery overnight. But with others still in the hospital, the death toll here could still rise. And Wendy, we know state, Wendy, we know state investiga investigators say the gunman had a rifle. We don't know if any other guns were used. Do we at this point know how the gunman may have gotten his hands on any weapons? And do we know anything about a possible motive at this time? Investigators are searching for a motive like I'm sure the entire country at this point, Joe, wants to know the answer to the senseless question, why? Uh, we do know that he did buy these two guns in the area either on or just after his 18th birthday. It's very recent, like in the last week or two. Exactly how he went about doing this, how he made the plans to do so, they are looking <coughs> for that motive. They are scouring his social media accounts. They believe he possibly alluded <coughs> to wanting to harm someone there, but they have to confirm and go back painstakingly step by step. You also mentioned that he um, shot his grandmother before coming to this school. We do know she has survived and hopefully at some point investigators will be able to talk to her and possibly shed some light on what happened here. It was a state senator who said he was told that the young man bought guns on his 18th birthday. What's unclear at this point is if those were the weapons that were used in this shooting. Wendy, I also want you to tell us more about the victims at this school. While authorities have not re officially released any names, we are hearing from some of the families who are telling us more about the victims, both the kids and a teacher. What can you tell us about some of those victims? We, we know that this school behind me was a, one of about 600 kids. Um, they ain't ranged in age from seven, eight, and nine-year-olds. Uh, Joe, the, they, were, they were wrapping up the school year, as, as we all do, and they were having a fancy day, a footloose and fancy day. So they all came here uh, with, their, with their nice clothes on, expecting to celebrate ending another school year. And, and, and tragically, you know, 19 kids and two of those teachers won't be going home. Uh, there are faces, there are stories behind, behind each one of them, and not just the, the, the 21 families who lost people, but this is a tight 
tight-knit community. We are about 70 miles from the uh, border with Mexico, South Texas, and everybody knows everyone here. It's a small, tight-knit community, and if you didn't lose someone in that senseless shooting last night, Joe, you know someone who did. And uh, it's, a, it's a grieving, it's a, it's a shock, and, and frankly, people are just still numb walking around here. Um, I don't know that anyone will ever really get over it. This, this, the school certainly will never be the same, the community never be the same, and they are just asking and pleading for people to pray. They think at this point that's the only way that's going to get them through. And I know we're actually hearing from some people in the community. I believe we do have some sound from people. Let's take a listen to that. It's really hard to see what happened today here as a grandma. Yeah, it is very hard. I can't, I can't imagine going through that with one of my grandkids. I, my heart is broken for the parents here in Uvalde. It's never thought something like this would happen in a small town and friendly as Uvalde. We've learned through family the names of one of the teachers who was killed, Eva Morellis, who's been teaching for 17 years. Wendy Wolfolk, thank you so much for your reporting this morning. We appreciate it. Now we want to play you an interview from a man who says he visited his wife. She's a teacher at the school. He was there just minutes before this horrific shooting happened. Take a listen to his account. Uh, they were close to, matter of fact, I had just taken her some flowers. And uh, the minute I got in my pickup, I heard a couple of shots. And then immediately the police were there. And uh, her, her class and everybody that was around her got in the cafeteria and uh, just kind of turned off the lights, got on the stage, started papering the windows. She said the kids were real good, real, real quiet, and did what they were supposed to. And your wife is okay? Yeah, she's good. And why were you bringing her flowers? Uh, she's retiring Friday. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So she's, uh, she's done. Thank goodness. As soon as I walked off to get in my truck, she went in the cafeteria because they were having a program. And as soon as she heard the, you know, whatever their call sign is to get buckled down, she got them all up on the stage. And I'm sure there was other teachers with her doing their deal. I heard two pops. And then uh, immediately a policeman drove up, drove, drove up to my truck. And I said, with his lights going on, I said, what could I possibly have done wrong? And he said, we have a shooter. He said, you need to go. Okay. So I turned around and backed out. And is she still in there? Who's yeah, inside? Yeah, she's still in there. Oh, can you describe what's going on inside? Uh, they're just they're getting their names and all the uh, room numbers of the teachers that are still in there and trying to get tent, tent transportation back to the old school. And I'm going to go get my truck ready to haul whoever I can to go get their seats. I didn't get their vehicles. President Biden delivered an emotional address to the nation last night following the shooting in Texas. He called on Congress to act and take up new gun control reforms. The violence at Robb Elementary School comes less than two weeks after 10 people were killed in a mass shooting at a supermarket in Buffalo, New York, and nearly 10 years since the tragedy at Sandy Hook Elementary School where 20 children were murdered. NBC News Digital White House reporter Shannon Pettypiece joins us now. So, Shannon, what was the president's main message last night? Well, I mean, his speech at times was emotional, at other times it was angry, but overall it was a call on lawmakers to act, because at this point there was only so much the president can do that's left from the executive branch. There are some steps he has tried to take as president, but he said right now it is up to Congress, it is up to lawmakers, uh, and he used some very strong words, specifically calling out the gun lobby and telling lawmakers to stand up to the gun lobby. Here's a bit more of what he had to say. Why are we willing to live with this carnage? Why do we keep letting this happen? Where in God's name is our backbone to have the courage to deal with it and stand up to the lobbies? It's a time to turn this pain into action for every parent, for every citizen in this country. We have to make it clear to every elected official in this country, it's time to act. And as far as whether officials are going to act, there are not enough votes in Congress right now to pass gun control legislation uh, of, in any current version. But the president says he really would like to see is an assault weapons ban and universal background checks for everyone who goes to buy a gun. 
Shannon, we know the president also takes on the role of consoler in chief during times like this, something that we saw last night. I mean, this is something that's personal to him, losing a child. What kind of message did he offer to the parents who just lost their child? Well, right. In addition to this call for action, he talked about the pain that he he knows firsthand from his experience of losing uh, not only his son, but his wife and his baby daughter uh, decades ago, uh, that they feel in this moment um, Ask the country to offer their condolences and prayers for them. And here's a bit more of what he had to say. To lose a child is like having a piece of your soul ripped away. There's a hollowness in your chest. You feel like you're being sucked into it and never going to be able to get out. It's suffocating. It's never quite the same. Give the parents and siblings the strength in the darkness they feel right now. And so you mentioned those uh, remarks in Buffalo or the Buffalo shooting lesson two weeks ago. It was exactly a week to the day yesterday that he was in Buffalo meeting with the families of the victims and the first responders in that shooting and giving a very similar speech, talking about the pain of those family members, and yet again, a call for action. And this is something the president said, he continues to hope he will never have to do again, but unfortunately, uh, all signs indicate that this is something he will face again in the remainder of his time as president. I mean, so Shannon, given the president's background on fighting for stricter gun laws, especially after Sandy Hook, do you expect this might recharge the White House, that the White House will try and make this a priority and, and take the lead on any gun reform bills? Well, certainly saw, we saw after Sandy Hook a resurgence in the debate around gun control and the protests following that, that really did not do much to change the reality of the situation. There have been some changes around the margins, and the president has been taking some executive actions. We are now in an election year. I'm sorry to make this about politics, but in an election year, things don't get done in Washington. Um, we are certainly very close to uh, the summer campaign season heating up. And in all likelihood, Republicans will take control of either one branch or both branches of co houses of Congress, uh, re even further reducing the odds that there is any gun control legislation that gets passed, uh, at least in the, the two years ahead, if that were to happen. Shannon Petty, peace. Thank you so much. Well, the shooting is once again reigniting the debate over gun laws. Connecticut Senator Chris Murphy, who was elected just weeks before the 2012 mass shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School, well, he took to the Senate floor and gave an impassioned plea to his colleagues. This isn't inevitable. These kids weren't unlucky. This only happens in this country and nowhere else. Nowhere else do little kids go to school thinking that they might be shot that day. Nowhere else do parents have to talk to their kids, as I have had to do, about why they got locked into a bathroom and told to be quiet for five minutes just in case a bad man entered that building. Nowhere else does that happen except here in the United States of America, and it is a choice. It is our choice to let it continue. But I'm here on this floor to beg, to literally get down on my hands and knees and beg my colleagues. Find a path forward here. Work with us to find a way to pass laws that make this less likely. NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Rafa joins us now with more. Ali, good morning. We just listened to Senator Murphy literally begging his colleagues in the Senate to do something. He said they don't have to agree with him on everything, but they have to do something. What is the reaction this morning? Yeah, Vicki, an extremely emotional speech on the Senate floor by Senator Murphy yesterday. Uh, well, when our team uh, went around asking lawmakers for the reaction to this shooting, several of them told us that they were learning about it for the first time from us. So we were able to see uh, their real and raw reaction. They were reactions of disgust, of horror, of disappointment, because this is happening yet again. We saw uh, Democrats like, as you played, Senator Chris Murphy of Connecticut, uh, 
uh, the state where Sandy Hook Elementary School, where that shooting took place uh, almost a decade ago, come December. Uh, once again, he pushed for uh, legislation for gun reform, uh, as you played in the clip, literally begging his Republican colleagues to make changes here. Republicans, meanwhile, are uh, really not having the appetite for this. They, uh, we caught up with uh, Senator Ted Cruz and John Cornyn of Texas, and while they both were extremely emotional and expressed their disappointment in this, uh, they're sticking with their beliefs on where things are right now. They're saying that uh, gun reform should take place in the form of more law enforcement in schools, hardening of schools, uh, teaching uh, teachers how to use guns in schools rather than uh, restricting gun rights for citizens. And uh, Cruz rejecting the idea of these stricter gun laws, calling for more law enforcement on school campuses. Listen here. We are seeing way too many of these horrific mass murders, and we need to devote far more law enforcement resources to stopping violent criminals, preventing these kind of absolute acts of evil. You know, inevitably, when there's a murder of this kind, uh, you see politicians try to politicize it. Uh, you see Democrats and a lot of folks in the media whose immediate solution is to try to restrict uh, the constitutional rights of law-abiding citizens. That doesn't work. It's not effective. It doesn't prevent crime. Now, Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said in the aftermath of that racially motivated shooting in Buffalo, New York, that he wouldn't put a vote on the Senate floor because he knew it was destined to fail in this 50-50 Senate, that Democrats wouldn't have the votes uh, to even pass a filibuster. Uh, but, Vicky, this issue has suddenly shot to the top of the legislative agenda. We're likely to uh, have even more reaction from lawmakers on Capitol Hill today, possibly even a vote on some legislation soon. As you said, as Shannon Petty piece said, there aren't enough votes. This is divided along party lines. What are lawmakers saying about how to prevent guns from getting in the hands of dangerous people then? Yeah, so there are already two House bills that have passed in the House and have stalled in the Senate. These are two bills that would expand background checks. Uh, specifically, one of them uh, would uh, expand background checks for all firearms sales or transfer in the country because currently background checks are not required for sales by unlicensed and private sellers. Uh, the second of them would close what has become known as the Charleston loophole, that loophole that allows licensed gun sales to go through before required background check is done. Those have already been drafted. Those have already been voted on in the House. Senate Majority Leader uh, Chuck Schumer took action last night. Uh, to actually not necessarily schedule a vote on these, but basically get it to the next step so that when the Senate is ready, that this is already in place to uh, then take a vote on the Senate floor. We don't know exactly when a vote could take place. We know senators are expected to leave for a Memorial Day recess on Thursday, uh, so it could take place when senators come back. Uh, it's it's really uh, up in the air right now, Vicki. Ali Rafa, thank you. Coming up, we'll have the latest on the Texas school shooting just ahead, as well as some of the other major stories this morning. And up next, the results are in for key primary races across the country. That includes Georgia, where we will see a repeat of a 2018 matchup. This is Morning News Now. Welcome back. Uh, more of our coverage of the deadly school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, just ahead. But first, here are some of the other stories making headlines right now. In Battleground, Georgia, this morning, the results from some pivotal Republican primaries are shedding light on the influence of former President Trump and the power of his lies about election fraud as we head into the midterm elections this fall. In the race for governor, incumbent Brian Kemp easily defeated Trump-backed challenger David Perdue, winning by a more margin of more than 50 percent. Kemp was frequently targeted by Trump for refusing to support election fraud claims in the 2020 election. Kemp will now face Democratic nominee Stacey Abrams, who ran unopposed. It'll be a rematch of their close 2018 race for governor. Mm -hmm. Joining us now is NBC News senior political editor Mark Murray. Mark, good morning to you. So that high-profile Republican primary for governor really ended in a rout, as some polls predicted. First, what are your takeaways from Kemp's victory? And then also, what should we know going into that general election rematch against Stacey Abrams? Will it likely be as close as it was four years ago? 
Yeah, Joe, this was the most lopsided primary uh, defeat for a either sitting or former U.S. senator like David Perdue was since 2010, when Rick Perry ended up defeating Kay Bailey Hutchinson in Texas. And that was just by a 20-point margin. What we saw last night was a 50-point uh, victory by Brian Kemp over David Perdue. Um, and as far as when it comes to a general election uh, matchup, this is going to be a rematch, Kemp versus Stacey Abrams. We saw Kemp end up defeating Stacey Abrams in 2018 by just a little bit more than a percentage point. This is a tougher political environment for Democrats right now than 2018 was. But we have to actually see how the former president, Donald Trump, ends up reacting to this. Back in September, he ended up suggesting that he would be OK if Stacey Abrams ended up defeating Kemp. He was so angry at Brian Kemp. So I'm looking forward to seeing how Donald Trump ends up reacting and whether he decides to endorse Kemp. Let's talk about the Senate race there in Georgia. Someone Trump supported, former football star Herschel Walker, won the GOP nomination handily there. He's now looking to unseat the incumbent Democrat Raphael, Reverend Raphael Warnock. So this is expected to be one of the most expensive and competitive races in the country this fall. What more can you tell us about Walker's campaign and the issues that both candidates are going to be running on in this one? Yeah, it's going to be interesting on how Walker ends up uh, withering any kind of attacks that come his way. He is a brand new political candidate. Uh, obviously, he's a, a sports uh, celebrity and uh, ended up doing some work for Donald Trump in 2020. Uh, but uh, Democrats plan to uh, throw a lot of the campaign finance uh, uh, allegations against Herschel Walker, allegations of domestic violence in his home. And so uh, how a Walker ends up reacting to that will be really key. Raphael Warnock, the Democratic incumbent, who ended up winning the uh, runoff in, in early 2021, has already been running millions of dollars in TV ads with a new one about how he's trying to help constituents such as those who had been impacted by tornadoes in, uh, in, in the state of Georgia. And so he's trying to really run on how he has delivered for Georgia so far. And Democrats are preparing for TV ads coming and, and hitting her. Walker. It was a busy night in Georgia. Two other incumbent Republicans were able to fend off Trump-backed challengers in Georgia, most notably Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger and also Attorney General Chris Carr. They both won their races and what some saw as a referendum on Trump's election fraud claim. So what does this now mean for Trump and really for the Republican Party heading into these midterms? Joe, I think the biggest takeaway is that for elected officials who are Republicans who decided to certify the election results in 2020, who discounted Donald Trump's lies that there was somehow fraud that went on, you can end up winning your own Republican primaries, even if Donald Trump puts everything into it. And as we even ended up seeing in the gubernatorial election, Donald Trump starred in ads for David Perdue in that gubernatorial primary. And so Donald Trump Trump can be defeated and can be defeated badly, even if most Republicans still consider him the leader of today's Republican Party. Mark Murray, thank you so much. We turn now to some international news. Moscow is attempting to take control of two cities in eastern Ukraine. NBC's Janice Mackey Freyer joins us from Beijing with that and more international headlines. Janice, good morning. Good morning, Joe and Vicky. We begin with Ukraine. Three months after Russia's invasion, and there is heavy fighting to take control of territory in the eastern part of the country around Luhansk. Russian forces are trying to encircle two cities that straddle a river. Ukrainian forces, along with residents, are trying their best to put up stiff resistance. What happens in this eastern part of the country, a major growing region, will have far-reaching implications with the U.N warning the world faces its worst food crisis in decades since the invasion. North Korea has fired at least three ballistic missiles today, just a day after President Biden finished his first trip to Asia, when he talked about the need to step up measures to deter the regime from testing. South Korea's military believes that one of the missiles failed. Another is likely an ICBM, the sort of long-range missile that's capable of reaching the continental United States. It's widely expected that Kim Jong-un will soon test another nuclear device. This is a big concern that was hanging over President Biden's trip to the region. And finally, some good luck times two. Uh, there were some people stranded on two small boats 
floating for days in the Pacific near the remote island of Kiribati when they were spotted by a New Zealand military Orion plane and rescued. The plane's crew was able to contact nearby boats, so the stranded sailors were picked up, including an 11-year-old. But here's the amazing part. The two boats weren't actually together. They were reported missing in separate incidents and just happened to be 10 nautical miles apart from each other when that plane flew overhead. Wow. So a bit of luck no on their side today. Big ocean, small world. All right. Yeah, nice to have a bit of good news too this morning. Indeed. Janice, thank you. Time to get a check on our morning news now weather. Michelle Grossman joins us live here in studio. Good morning to you, Michelle. Good morning to you both. And we continue to watch heavy, heavy rain in the south. And that's going to be the trend over the next couple of days. We have a very slow moving storm. It's kind of feeding off the Gulf as well. You can see a lot of lightning, hearing the thunder as well. And lots of heavy rain along the Gulf Coast of Texas, along the Gulf Coast states as well. That will be the stories we had throughout this Wednesday. Notice how far this rain reaches all the way to parts of the upper Midwest, the Ohio Valley, into parts of the South Plains. And that's the story with the uh, heavy, heavy rain. We're also looking at the chance for some strong thunderstorms. So it's showers and bended thunderstorms with winds gusting to 60 miles per hour, damaging hail, a low risk for tornadoes, not a zero chance, but still it's low. So that's the good news. The big concern here will be the heavy rain. You could see it in the South Central States into the Tennessee Valley, the Mississippi Valley, into the upper Midwest and the Ohio Valley. It moves to the east tomorrow. And then by Friday, look what happens. It's the start of the unofficial start to summer. And we're looking at a wet start in the east from New York City to D.C., Richmond, Raleigh, Wilmington, also Charleston, you're at a slight risk for severe weather. 32 million people at risk on Friday. We're looking at winds gusting to 60 miles per hour, damaging hail once again. A low risk for tornadoes again, but we're going to see that heavy rain falling on Friday into early parts of Saturday for the Northeast. So your rainfall forecast, you you can see those darker colors along the Gulf Coast states. We're looking at reds, oranges, yellows. That's where we're seeing the heavy rain falling, even up to four inches in some spots through Friday. Because of that, we have a flood threat, repeated rounds of rain. Where you see the green, that's your flood watch. And most likely, we're going to see flash flood warnings in and out as we head throughout the day today. Also looking at a heat advisory. This is another big story. Seven million people impacted on the California coast. And not the coast, interior parts of California, excuse me, with temperatures into the 90s and 100s. Wow. And it's still May. I know. Crazy. Michelle, thank you. We appreciate it. Sure. Well, we are following the very latest on the school shooting in Texas all morning. That includes a closer look at the spike in active shooter incidents. The tragedy in Texas comes just 10 days after the mass shooting in Buffalo. Coming up, can anything be done to put an end to these acts of violence? Our law enforcement expert weighs in. Plus, children these days are unfortunately no strangers to active shooter drills at school. So how can parents talk to their young kids about the school shooting in Texas? A therapist will join us next. We're continuing our coverage of the school shooting at Robb Elementary in Uvalde, Texas. At least 19 children and two adults have been killed. The 18-year-old shooter is also dead. The investigation into the attack is now underway as authorities piece together the moments leading up to the shooting, including how the gunman was able to enter the school. NBC News national security correspondent Ken Delanian joins us now for more. Ken, good morning. So this is interesting. The Texas Department of Public Safety said last night a school resource officer and two city police officers were unable to bring the shooter down because the gunman was wearing body armor. What more do we know about this? And what does it tell us about how the attack was planned and the security at the school. Good morning, Joe. Well, it suggests the attacker planned very carefully, and it raises uncomfortable questions about whether he was copying the shooter in Buffalo, who also wore body armor and who also was engaged by a security guard who was unable to bring him down. This is a really disturbing trend. So what the Texas official told our colleague last night is that this shooter crashed a vehicle outside the school, and then entered the school with a rifle and began <laughs> shooting children and teachers, and then was engaged by uh, two local police officers and a school resource officer who presumably were armed only with handguns. And the Texas official said that they were unable to bring him down. There are some reports that some one or more of them may have been wounded in that in that exchange of gunfire, they had to wait for a better armed tactical team, a SWAT team armed with high powered rifles to come in. And that happened. And then uh, that team was able to shoot and kill uh, the gunman. That raises a huge question about what happened in the interval there. How many children died because 
this gunman had more powerful weapons than police officers and had body armor, which, by the way, Joe, is unregulated. It's perfectly legal in Texas to order on the Internet military style body armor with uh, ceramic plates that, that could stop even a rifle bullet. Um, and so the extent to which these mass shooters are, are, are copying one another um, and, and, and using body armor and other kinds of tactical gear makes these kinds of things all the more disturbing, Joe. Ken, do we know, have investigators learned anything about the shooter and a possible motive through social media? Uh, investigators are looking at an Instagram account, they tell us, that they believe is linked to the shooter. They have not confirmed it yet as of the last time we checked. Um, and that account uh, shows photos of two assault rifles, and there, there is some chatter that, that the shooter may have reached out to, a, to an unrelated random person in Los Angeles and, and tipped that person off that something big was going to happen. Um, there are also interviews with uh, friends of the shooter. The Washington Post, for example, quotes two people who said that he changed in recent months, began dressing in black, wearing military-style boots, even engaged in some self-harm behavior. And that really fits a pattern, Joe, in these, in these, uh, these kinds of cases, which unfortunately we've all covered way too many of, uh, where it always emerges that there are warning signs. It's, what's, it's what the experts call leakage. People who engage in this behavior often tell other people about things that are happening in their lives, that provide signs that, that they are in crisis, but often it doesn't get the, to the right place. The big question here is whether this person, Salvador Ramos, had any previous encounters with authorities. We don't know that yet. Whether there were any opportunities to stop this, to intervene in this person's life. Joe. Ken, it's obviously early in the investigation, but really at this point, what are some of the key questions that remain unanswered? So the one I just mentioned, you know, the question of whether there were police interactions, obviously the ATF is going to trace the provenance of the guns. They probably already know uh, because it's believed that these guns were purchased legally. Uh, a state senator said actually he bought them the, the, on his 18th birthday, which was last week. Uh, so, you know, he would have been legal to purchase assault rifles in Texas at age 18. You know, questions of motive, obviously, um, questions about the sequence of events and what happened. You know, uh, officials said he shot his grandmother before this attack. Uh, she's believed to be in critical condition. So, so that's a big question of, of what happened there to set this person off. But really, the, the major questions in this case are more societal, Joe. How does this keep happening? What do we do to stop it? Why can an 18-year-old get a weapon of war and outgun police officers and kill 19 children? So many questions. Ken Delaney, and thanks so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. The shooting happened just 24 hours after the FBI released a new report that showed active shootings in America increased by more than 50 percent just last year. Let that sink in for a moment. We want to bring in NBC News law enforcement analyst Cedric Alexander. Cedric, we appreciate you being with us this morning. Uh, you were with the Morning News now just yesterday talking about that FBI report. And since that time, one more mass shooting at another school, an elementary school for second to fourth graders. Education Week tracks these school shootings, and they say there have been 27 in the U.S. so far just this year. We're in May of 2022, 27 shootings. What can we do to stop this from happening? Well, first of all, uh, when you see this type of trend that's clearly emerging right in front of us, where we're now seeing these mass shootings not once a month, but once every seven to 10 days, that should raise really our level of concern way beyond what we are now. Because certainly what we're really doing, we're just continuing to say the same thing over and over and over. Mm -hmm. And what this country needs now, more important than anything else, is less talk and more leadership, particularly from the federal level. And I mean that in a way that we all support our elected constituents, but it has just gotten to a point now where the right and the left are going to have to find a way to lead this country. And they both can blame each other for their own political ideas around guns. But the fact of the matter is you have over 300 million Americans in this country who are looking for those that sit in Congress and U.S. senators to be able to help us and get us out of this place we're in. Because when we have babies, eight, 10 years of age, uh, kill, that is, it's, it's a sad day in this country. When you and I were talking about this yesterday morning, you were saying there's, there's really only so much that state and local officials can do. Are there changes that can happen at the federal level so that law enforcement can better identify possible shooters and try to stop them? 
Well, I think there's some things that you can do in small number, but you have to remember we have over 300 million people in this country. We have 700,000 police officers. Certainly, if they can get in front of someone who they have been notified that may be a risk or a threat to the community, they do that, and police do it very well. But the fact of the matter is, is that we have a large contingency of people that live in this country who may go awry and may carry out or act out in ways that were totally unpredictable. So we have a huge problem here. This is a societal issue, uh, as you indicated here earlier. Uh, and we are going to have to fix this. But gun control in this country, the availability, the accessibility of guns, are far greater than what we recognize that are causing these threats and these continued deaths across this country. And it's just not people with mental health illnesses. It's people for a variety of different reasons, variety of different motives that has to be addressed. We cannot simplify this incident on yesterday and in Buffalo and all that has happened in between. We have to really aggressively go after this issue now as a nation because we cannot stand as a nation with this type of violence taking place in our communities across this country every other day. Cedric Alexander, with your decades of law enforcement insight, we really appreciate your, uh, your joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you for having me. For more on the impact this can have on kids, we're joined now by Dr. George James. He's a licensed marriage and family therapist. Dr. James, thanks so much for joining us this morning. We appreciate it. I mean, as we mentioned earlier, there have been more than two dozen school shootings so far just this year alone. A lot of parents are wondering, how do I talk to my kids, especially my younger kids, about something like this? Because it's a topic that is really tough to avoid right now. Yeah, um, you know, good morning, Joe and Vicky. Unfortunately, you know, this is a very sad um, just occurrence, and it, it puts parents in a position to have to talk about things that they might not want to or might not feel prepared. Uh, things like talking about death, talking about violence, talking about shooting, and trying to figure out how to share that with their young children. And so the biggest thing that I encourage people to do is to say something or to share things that are age appropriate. You know, you, for your very young kids, you can say something very bad happened and it's hurtful and it's sad and we're going to talk about what that means. For those that, uh, as children get older, you get more specific in the details mm -hmm. and you try to help them understand w what is going on and what to do about it. But most of all, you want to comfort them. Uh, and it's hard, and, and with everything that's going on, with all the anxiety, it's hard to say that, like, you know, uh, that you will be safe. But you do want to provide some safety to your children to say that we will do all that we can to protect you and to take care of you. You know, uh, school safety, obviously, it is something that weighs heavily both on children and us as parents. When your kids specifically tell you, look, I, I just don't feel safe at school. What can you specifically say back to them to help them regain that sense of security? Yeah, you know, when children will feel unsafe, right? And and sometimes they will hear it from their other classmates or they'll hear it from in different ways. What you can share with your children is allowing them to know that they're not alone, uh, to letting them know that, that these things do bring some uncertainty and some anxiety, and to share with them some of the things that you do. Uh, one of the things I often encourage my clients to do is like, how do you incorporate deep breathing? How do you uh, use creative skills? How do you also take care of yourselves and also know things that to protect yourself in, in, in terms of understanding safety, uh, what to do and what not to do? These are things that might help people to feel more secure, especially our children, but they're often looking to us as parents and adults and guardians for their safety. Mm -hmm. And when we can show them and share that, that can help them to then figure out what they need to do in their own lives. Dr. James, we now have entire generations of children who grew up in an era of school shootings. I was remembering the Washington Post analysis just a few years ago. It found more than 311,000 students have experienced gun violence at schools. That's a, a staggering number. What is the best way to help our kids cope with the effects of all this violence? So many children, many young folks uh, might deal with anxiety just in, normally in their life. Uh, as they are, are growing up in, in, a, in this type of environment, it might increase their anxiety. And so we want to help them to deal with their anxiety. We want them to name it. We want them to find coping skills. We want them to have strategies. We want them to be able to talk about what's going on with them. We want to pay attention to their behavior, their sleeping patterns, their eating patterns. And we would then want to provide ways to help them, help them with being more physically 
active, with communicating, with articulating, with maybe talking to a therapist. So we want to help them to, to guide them during this time because, unfortunately, this is more normal than it should ever be. And so we have to help them deal with it and be aware of what's going on so that it doesn't overwhelm them too much and that they don't end up acting out in ways that are destructive to them or those around them. Dr. George James, we always appreciate your advice, especially this morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. We will continue to follow the latest developments on the Texas school shooting throughout this morning. Also ahead, President Biden is expected to sign an executive order on policing on the two-year anniversary of George Floyd's murder. We're going to take a look at the impact this order could have on the relationship between communities of color and police officers. You're watching Morning News Now. Today marks two years since George Floyd was murdered by a Minneapolis police officer. His death, of course, sparked protests and calls for police reform all around the world. Later today, President Joe Biden is expected to sign a long-awaited executive order to reform policing practices. According to two sources familiar with the matter, this policy will create a national registry of officers fired for misconduct. It will encourage state and local police to tighten restrictions on chokeholds and so-called no-knock warrants. And it would also restrict the transfer of military equipment to law enforcement agencies. For more on that, we're joined by New York Times columnist and MSNBC political analyst Charles Blow. Charles, thanks so much for joining us this morning. I mean, first, I want to talk with you about that executive order the president is expected to sign. We know no single piece of legislation or an order can resolve generations of distrust between communities of color and the police. But do you think this is a step in the right direction? And in your mind, does it do enough? Well, I first think we always have to preface these conversations by saying the Republicans killed uh, federal uh, police uh, reform uh, with Tim Scott leading their side of negotiations. We also have to say that uh, the only thing left to do was executive orders, and they are incredibly limited in what they can accomplish, and that any change is good change, uh, and that we haven't seen the, the, the wording of this order. All that said, you know, I think it's really sad that this is where we end up. Uh, this is not going to reform policing in America. It is, you know, it, it does not even go at the bulk of the police killings uh, in this country. You know, one thing that, that, according to the sources, that this order does is that it um, cracks down on the use of chokeholds and New York warrants by federal law enforcement agencies. Well. You know, two thirds of federal law enforcement uh, officers, I wrote this down, the, a third of them are border customs and border protection, and 14% uh, uh, Federal Bureau of, of Prisons, FBI is about 10%, Immigration and Customs about 10%. That's two thirds of those officers. These are not the officers who are in communities. These are not the people who are killing people, uh, many of them black on the streets. And so it doesn't even go at that. Uh, mm -hmm. It encourages. Uh, local law enforcement to follow suit by incentivizing around money and funding. But the president has already said that he believes that police deserve more funding, not less. So it's very hard to see how this works and how much of a tightrope the, the administration is going to have to walk on that point. So, it, you know, there are things like, you know, make, creating a registry of people who have been fired so they don't, they don't hop from one department to another. Mm -hmm. But it really does okay. not get at accountability and a fundamental change in policing. And so that makes it very sad that this is where we end up on the issue. Yeah, Charles, you're very pessimistic on this executive order. Obviously, it had to happen because there was no bipartisan support in Congress. There is that registry, though, that helps prevent officers with a history of misconduct from continuing to show up and, and do that job. The other part is the restricting of military equipment being transferred to police departments. I mean, what do you think of this will work and what additionally do you think needs to happen for that accountability part? I think we have to be clear that, according to the reports, it doesn't prevent them from continuing to show up and continue to do the job. What it does is it creates a registry, and if the department chooses to use the registry and chooses to, to use the information in it not to hire someone, they can do that. Mm -hmm. But what ends up happening, we see in case after case, many of these people have had complaints against them never fired. They would never show up on the registry because they're never fired for, for having complaints against them. So it doesn't stop bad policing because people complain about policing. It just says that if it gets to a point that the police department has to fire you, we will write that down.
right? So it's, it, you know, I, I don't want to be too cynical about it, but I mean, it just doesn't get at the nut of the, uh, of the issue. Anything is better than nothing. But this is very close to being nothing. Hmm. Charles Blow, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We really do appreciate your time. Well, coming up, there are ways you can help the victims and families of the Robb Elementary School shooting. There's an urgent need for blood donations. How you can help meet that need, even if you don't live in Texas. That's next. Tuesday's mass shooting in Texas is renewing discussions about school security and raises the key question, is there any way to stop these school shootings? NBC News correspondent Stephanie Gosk takes a closer look. This morning, the question on top of many parents' minds, are my children safe at school? There have been 27 school shootings this year alone, according to Education Week. The disturbing rise in violence leading a growing number of schools to incorporate extensive safety measures, all in an effort to avoid being the site of the next school shooting. Those measures include modern high-tech security systems, ranging from facial recognition to gun detection software. We really have to make every attempt to stay on the most cutting edge, if you will, of that technology. Back in 2019, we profiled a school in upstate New York employing this first of its kind system. The technology immediately recognizes a gun pulled from its holster. If Officer Stover were a school shooter, this new high-tech security system would immediately call the police and then track his every movement by scanning both his face and the gun. Many school districts are also pursuing simpler solutions as well, from increasing armed guards to adding more metal detectors, and in some cases, even allowing teachers to carry guns. No particular place, especially schools, are 100 percent foolproof. We have to have people who are observing, paying attention, uh, people who ask questions, people who intervene, and people who notify the authorities if they think that something is not right. But with children and teachers still being murdered in classrooms, some parents are left wondering if the current security is enough. Andrew Pollack, whose daughter Meadow was killed in the 2018 shooting at Marjorie Stoneham Douglas High School, says many schools still haven't learned critical lessons. How hard could it be to have a single point of entry and armed uh, policemen or highly trained teachers at the school? It just angers me. It, it, this thing that has to happen today. Our thanks to Stephanie Gosk for that report. Now, in the aftermath of the shooting, there's an urgent push underway to get blood to those in need. And joining us now is the COO of South Texas Blood and Tissue, Adrian Mendoza. Adrian, thank you for being with us this morning. We know an emergency blood drive is set up for later today. How important is it for you to have this fully stocked blood bank and how desperately needed is this blood right now? Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. It is um, the blood that's collected today that's ready for the unimaginable tomorrow. So we were very grateful that we had blood here in South Texas to support the victims yesterday. Um, and we need to raise awareness about the need for the ongoing need for blood donors uh, throughout the country and the world. In the past, with mass shootings, we've seen these long lines of people waiting to give blood. Uh, the Pulse nightclub shooting in Orlando comes to mm -hmm. mind. I remember the response after that. Are you seeing a response like that so far? What's, what's the community, how have they been responding so far? There has been a huge outpouring of support here in our community. We've had over 600 appointments um, today to give blood. Yesterday, we had uh, many people show up after the news broke of the Uvalde mass shooting, and uh, we had about 700 people donate blood just yesterday. So in our community, there's been a huge outpouring. I know many people throughout the country are also trying to find ways to help, and they can definitely contact their local blood center and do the same. Uh, if they'd like to give in, in honor of, and also just to make sure that there's blood available for those who might need it today, tomorrow, and the weeks ahead um, in any area of our country. Adrian, I think you just answered my question, which is if you're not nearby, what can you do to help? So maybe it's calling up your local blood bank. Can you also tell us what you need to know who qualifies to donate blood? Sure. Anyone uh, about 16 years, depending on your parental consent in each state, to any age. There's no age limit on, on giving blood, and about 60 percent of the U.S. population is eligible to give. Um, unfortunately, only 3 percent actually do give. And it's important to know that blood donation really needs to be done routinely. Blood's perishable, and it expires very quickly. 
A few months ago, we were talking about the shortage that was happening around the country. Is that still the case? I mean, just outside of tragedies like this, what has the situation been like with the blood bank supply? It is absolutely the case. The, the COVID pandemic really disrupted the way that blood drives are conducted, especially with employer-based settings. With hybrid and remote work, employer-based blood drives are not happening as frequently, and that's really taking a toll on blood banks everywhere. Um, when high schools were out, it also affected blood drives, especially the ability to recruit new donors. Many people learn of blood donation then. So uh, blood banks around the country are still struggling, and many are at a one-day supply or less of blood. Mm -hmm. So it's important to donate routinely if you can. And are there specific types of blood that are most in demand? Type O positive and O negative red blood cells are, are definitely in demand at all times, but there's a shortage nationally for all blood types. And no matter what your blood type is, there's a right type of blood to donate as well. We can donate red cells, we can donate plasma or platelets, and no matter what blood type you are, you're needed by somebody. And it really doesn't take a long time either. Adrian Mendoza, we appreciate your time. Thank you. That does it for this hour of Morning News Now. But the news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.